So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. We will begin with a new text today, uh, which will also be the last text for this course, which is uh, Munshi Premchand's short story, The Chess Place, which we will obviously read in translation. Uh, now, before we begin with the text, as always, we will look at the cultural context which produced this particular text. What were the parameters, uh, the cultural parameters, the social parameters, the political parameters, which were instrumental uh, uh, in terms of producing this text. Uh, so, in other words, we need to historicize the text. So, uh, looking at the historical location of this text in the context of uh, culture. Now, um, as in the case with most of the texts we have done so far, um, you know, we find that the context uh, supplies a lot of information about the text. The context not just determines uh, the matter in which, uh, which, which is there in the text, but also the manner in which get, it gets written and gets represented. Uh, so both matter and manner of each text, um, they are context sensitive uh, in many sense. So for this particular text, we find that uh, this is obviously a pre independence text. Uh, this was uh, the, the setting of this text and uh, is right around uh, the Sepoy rebellion uh, and this was still the time in which the, the company, the, the East Indian company, uh, they were ruling in there. They were like basically, uh, they came in as traders as you know, uh, they came in as a mercantile presence and then uh, you know, they, get, they began to get more and more uh, uh, involved in politics in terms of lending money to the kingdoms and lending money to the different uh, you know, dynasties which are ruling different parts of India and in that process getting more and more political clout, right? So it was one of the first multinational companies in, in the modern sense of the word of the term. Now uh, the East Indian Company is a very important uh, uh, presence in this particular short story. I mean it just, it never really appears uh, as a character but it's always there as some kind of spectral presence about to enter uh, the story and it does enter the, the setting of the story towards the end. Now some of you would know there is a very fine film uh, made on this uh, short story, a film by Satyajit Ray, it is called Shatan um, Shri um, which is the original title of the, uh, this, the story. And we, we are reading this in translation, hence the name Chess Place. But Shatran Shri Kiladi is the original name of the story uh, based on which is a film, a very fine film and I do recommend it quite heavily. It will give you lots of interesting insights into uh, the politics of representation and how do you take a text and adapt it into a film and what are the changes that you do uh, in a film. It's a different medium of representation and what happens when uh, matter travels across media, uh, from the print media to the, the cinematic media. So what are the refractions that take place, what are the bends uh, and diversions and departures which take place when matter travels from one medium to another medium. So th that film is a very good study as well of that meta politics of representation. But coming back to this text which we will begin in a moment, uh, I'll spend some time talking about the, the context as well and uh, as I mentioned but I think it's important for us to locate it and historicize it before we really uh, dive into the text uh, per se. Now. Uh, the, this is, the setting is Lucknow uh, as we know uh, and this is the time of Wazir Ali Shah, the last uh, uh, Nawab of Lucknow uh, who was deported uh, after uh, this, the, the Eastern Company took over. He was deported to Calcutta uh, and he came over to Calcutta with his entourage. So I mean, that's how Calcutta began to have uh, some kind of Nawabi influence in terms of culture, in terms of food, etc. Uh, for instance, the, the Calcutta biryani uh, which we have today was something which traveled from Lucknow. So again, that, that is a marker, a food marker, a material marker, which is also reflective of political change, a political shift. So the, the entire shift of Biryani from Lucknow to Calcutta is obviously reflective of the political shift from uh, of Wazir Ali Shah from Lucknow to Calcutta, where he was essentially sent off and deported and imprisoned by the British. Now, we find that uh, among other things, this is also a very fine study of economic shift. Uh, because what we see here is a transition from a feudal economy to a mercantile economy to a more capitalist economy if you will. Uh, so the feudal economy where money is controlled essentially by uh, some uh, feudal lords who have had the money come to them through inheritance essentially without having to do any work uh, whereas the rest of the people around are starving or are peasants, are farmers, are serfs etc. Uh, that was something which happened in medieval England for instance. Uh, and then we find that with the Randesa, uh, that economy had shifted in England to a certain extent and began to become more and more mercantile, more and more capitalist in society. And obviously, the East Indian Company um, is a very, very uh, pervasive presence uh, as a capitalist enterprise, uh, a money-making mercantile enterprise, a company 
essentially a multinational company, as I mentioned. Now, uh, the transition from the feudal economy to a capitalist economy, or in other words, in, in the case of the story, most specifically speaking, the transition from the Nawawi uh, economy to the company economy is something which we see uh, happening uh, in Shatnaj uh, Kekilari, the chess place. And if you look at the film, we find that it's a more graphic description of that kind of a shift, because towards the end of the film, we find the, the, uh, the army of the uh, company is marching in and obviously the army constitutes mostly of Indians who are paid mercenaries working in that army. Uh, so they're marching in Lucknow to take over Lucknow, whereas the uh, feudal lords of Lucknow are fleeing the houses, they're fleeing the, the forts, fleeing the palaces. Uh, and uh, the game of chess, which is a central activity in the story, it becomes a very important metaphor, a metaphor for inaction, a metaphor for a very narcissistic self-absorbing in action. So, you know, chess playing becomes a, a micro uh, activity which takes away the attention for all real macro activities. So, you find the two men over here, they get completely absorbed in this game of chess and endlessly playing games of chess, uh, completely oblivious to what's happening in the house, what's happening in the kingdom, what's happening in the political setting. And that becomes a very interesting reflection of the very narcissistic, almost pathological absorption. Uh, that the feudal lords began to have at that point in time, which was obviously quite detrimental to the economy, uh, quite detrimental to the politics, quite detrimental to the entire running of the state, as it were. And again, if you take a look at the film by Shatanjit Ray, uh, Shatanjit Kiladi, we find that uh, the way that Nawab is depicted in that uh, film, uh, he is someone who is, uh, obeys, he is quite almost uh, certainly hedonistic, uh, and he is a lover of pleasure. Uh, he sings songs, he writes shairies, uh, he flies kites, he hymns uh, songs and different kind of melodies at different points of time. Uh, so he's essentially, uh, from the point of view of the capitalist uh, mercantile uh, control system, he is quite uh, symbolically and quite stereotypically speaking the effeminate leader. So uh, his effeminacy is something which is portrayed in the film. Uh, quite sartorially as well. He's wearing oversized cloaks, oversized gowns all the time. Uh, whereas if you contrast that with the, uh, the dress that the British are wearing, the company people are wearing, they're cut uh, to precise measurements. Uh, so it is almost, uh, even sartorially, if you like take a look at the film, even sartorially, we find that there's a degree of excess in what uh, the Nawab is wearing. He's wearing excess clothes, he's wearing oversized gowns, oversized uh, cloaks. Uh, he's wearing oversized um, uh, thrones, uh, the, the uh, specters and everything is oversized around him. Uh, the crown is oversized, the throne is oversized, the cloak is oversized, the, go the gown is oversized. Whereas with the British, uh, the East India Company people, when they come in and there's a lovely scene in the film where they're having a meeting, we find that British officers are shown to be wearing a very cut and precise garments, tailor-made for them. Uh, it's not like one big size. So again, uh, that is reflective of the utility-driven economy of the company policy and the excessive economy uh, of the feudal policy. So everything is excessive with the feudal control, whereas everything is very utilitarian and pragmatic uh, and uh, sort of utility-driven to a certain extent and precision-driven when it comes to the company perspective of controlling the economy. So that contrast is running throughout the film. That contrast is also there in the story. Now. In that kind of a setting, in that kind of a tension or conflict of different kinds of cultural systems, cultural codes, etc., the game of chess becomes important. The game of chess becomes a very symbolic, uh, ludic activity, right? So, ludic is obviously playful, uh, L U D I C. Now, what that ludic activity does, what that ludic landscape does, it takes away attention for these people from the real political landscape. So, they're always obsessed with saving the king on a chessboard, they're always obsessed with saving the fort in a chessboard, they're always obsessed with saving the soldiers in a chessboard. Now, that uh, sort of pseudo proxy activity of saving kings and queens and pawns and, and uh, uh, forts in a chessboard, uh, it becomes a complete departure from the real activity of any engagement with the real king, with the real uh, fort, with the real uh, quality of kingdom, etc. So, the game of chess becomes a departure from reality. Uh, and that departure becomes more and more obsessive and almost pathological in quality. And we find that throughout the story, the two men, uh, Mir and Mirza, they, 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 uh, you know, they just run away from everything, you know, from responsibilities, from household responsibilities, from family responsibilities, from, uh, you know, uh, 
political responsibilities uh, and, and they just keep continuing and they continue to play the games of chess endlessly. Right? And this endless uh, playing of games on chess uh, in the story becomes obviously, as I mentioned, a departure, but also in a way uh, it becomes a reflection of a certain kind of masculinity. And it's a very complex story, it's a very interesting story to read uh, from the point of view of masculinity studies. Uh, for like just mentioned, uh, there are two kinds of masculinities at play at conflict over here. One is obviously the hedonistic, playful masculinity, uh, which is um, you know excessive, pleasure-loving, uh, irresponsible. And on the other hand, we have the other kind of masculinity coming in, uh, the utilitarian masculinity, you know, and you know it's uh, driven towards production, precision, control, protection, uh, etc. So all these different kinds of masculinities are at war with each other. And if you take a look at the film. We find that uh, towards the end of the film, there is a boy character, an adolescent boy uh, from Lucknow, uh, who is uh, supposed to be serving these two feudal lords playing chess. But instead of going to them straight away, um, he looks at the army of the company marching in, and that sight of the army marching in becomes, uh, you know, fascinating for him. And he's absolutely fascinated by that side, by the spectacle of the army coming in. And he's obviously becoming a consumer in a certain sense of that kind of masculinity, that, that order of masculinity literally marching in and also symbolically and spectacularly marching in the kingdom to take over. And that will become the new order of masculinity, the new order of politics, the new order of economy, uh, which is obviously controlled by men entirely. And hence this interesting collusion between masculinity and economy over here. Now, um, instead of that, what we have here uh, among the Lucknow people is that they absorbed in chess, they absorbed in opium, uh, they absorbed in alcohol, they absorbed in all kinds of intoxication, which is again very, very pleasure loving. So we have this pleasure principle versus the production principle that at war with each other. And obviously, the pleasure principle is going to lose. It's a lotus eater lifestyle uh, where they just drink nectar all day and do nothing. Um, that kind of a lifestyle is, you know, is depicted away. It's a bit like decadent Rome where you know, everyone was just alcoholic and you know, drinking and intoxicated and different kinds of activities. Uh, so uh, we have you know, the example of Lucknow, it's very, very decadent, very feudal and it's drowned in sensuality as we are told. Everyone is drunk or playing chess or being irresponsible or being pleasure loving, writing poems, flying kites, etc. Uh, the entire economy is um, geared towards pleasure, uh, building you know, pleasure monuments, uh, pleasure parks, um, etc. Whereas people around are starving, uh, there's a lot of discontent among farmers, among laborers, among people who are not getting paid, the soldiers are not getting paid. Uh, so, you know, th there's that discontent which is completely disregarded and this complete denial of any discontent and this uh, complete drive towards pleasure is what makes Lucknow uh, very hedonistic and very vulnerable as well. So, the fall of Lucknow in the story is just a natural fall. The company doesn't really have any conflict, uh, militarily speaking. Uh, so, there's no real war which happens, uh, there's no resistance whatsoever. In fact, the soldiers uh, flee from the uh, Nawab and join the British army in some sense because, you know, that is the only way they can get some sustenance for the families, there's the only way they can get paid, there's the only way they can have some wages, some, you know, uh, money for their labor. Whereas the Nawab over here in the story is completely oblivious to what's happening militarily uh, and he doesn't even know uh, the soldiers, he doesn't even know the political uh, subjects. It's completely disconnected from reality and there's a disconnect from reality at a bigger political, at a macro political uh, scene uh, is that disconnect is in a way domesticated uh, by the game of chess. So, the game of chess which takes place in the house, uh, in a household is an example of the bigger disconnect, is a reflection, is a microcosmic reflection of the bigger disconnect from reality that is there in a political scene. So, you know, th in that way the game becomes very political as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's political because it is all political. It is political because it's a departure from politics. It's a departure, it's a runaway, it's an escape from politics. So in that sense, it becomes political as well. Because as you know, uh, all political is also a very political position. Uh, so you know, if someone says, I'm, I'm, I don't have a stand on this, uh, that obviously becomes a stand in some sense. Right, so um, the game of chess, so a chess play, the setting, uh, the title uh, of the uh, story is obviously a reflection uh, of the certain kind of subject, certain kind of hedonistic, self absorbed, uh, pathological subjects, uh, pathologically pleasure loving subjects, um, which are on the way out, uh, who are on the way out. Uh, decadent, very decadent, uh, very, very drowned in all kinds of sensuality and very irresponsible uh, and very ludic as well, uh, excessive, ludic, pleasure loving, hedonistic. And that kind of economy 
that kind of masculinity, which is again collusive with the economy, uh, that is on its way out, right? So that the, the game of chess over here uh, becomes, uh, among other things, is also a production of procrastination, right? You keep producing procrastination just so you don't have to do any real work. You keep procrastinating through games of chess. So another game starts, uh, which means there's another time between uh, that you're inventing uh, to keep you away from real work. Right, so again, it's a way, in a way, like I said, it's a production of procrastination at a very symbolic level, uh, which again is connected to the real political level because that's exactly what was happening in the political scene. There was no real engagement with any urgent issues. Everything was being procrastinated. Everything was diverted away to some pleasure narrative, right? Uh, just so nothing got done, uh, nothing got uh, uh, really materialized. Uh, so this is the setting of the story, the political, cultural um, uh, setting uh, in which the story is situated and also the film as I mentioned if you take a look at the film it's a very useful film to look at because it's an excellent adaptation in some sense uh, of the uh, you know, entire uh, tension, the political, cultural, gender tension. There's also a very strong gender element in the story. We find that a woman in the story is essentially trapped, in the prisoners of this political regime of inaction where nothing gets done, where the men are irresponsible, men don't have any duty towards the household, uh, domestically, politically, culturally, nothing gets done. Uh, so they become more and more discontented. Uh, and we find that women over here, they, they're very, very repressed in the sense that, you know, the agency obviously is unavailable I and mean, there's zero agency to women and they uh, essentially get more and more frustrated. So the arrival of the company in, this, in some sense uh, may be seen as a reversal of that uh, situation of frustration. Uh, maybe the women get more agency when the, these people go away. We don't quite know that. That indication is not there uh, strongly. But there's a very clear indication, uh, a very clear message in the story that women in this Lucknow setting, this very hedonistic, feudal Lucknow setting, the women are extremely helpless, extremely agencyless, and they get more and more angry with the men uh, for not doing anything politically, for not taking up any political action, for not, not taking up any household action. So again, we, the relationship between spaces is very important in the story. What doesn't get done in the house also doesn't get done in the bigger political scene. So the house over here becomes an important scene, important space as well. Because the men over here, they are quite irresponsible towards their own house. And the irresponsibility towards the household spaces, the household features, uh, is again a reflection of the responsibility of the bigger political space, right? And so all the responsibility, all the energy uh, that they have is directed towards this ludic landscape of the chessboard, uh, the playful landscape of the chessboard. That's the only landscape in which any energy is diverted or in a focus on. Everything else is just uh, diluted. Uh, nothing gets done in the house, nothing gets done in the political scene. So in that setting, uh, the, the women become very, very helpless, the women become very, very agencyless, and they become very, very frustrated. So the frustration of the woman becomes a very important gender perspective uh, in the story. So the frustration is also erotic in quality. Uh, there's no relationship, uh, no, there's no conjugal relationship, uh, this man and this woman. There's also a very interesting angle that one can explore. Uh, the two men in the story uh, who keep playing chess, uh, all the time. Uh, there's no indication that they have any children. So again, the lack of productivity uh, it also spills over into a biological spare. They don't even engage in conjugal activity uh, in a proper sense, uh, you know, and that, you know, that obviously makes them extremely, not just hedonistic, but also uh, unproductive. So unproductivity uh, or non-productivity becomes a very important symbol in the story. And that non-productivity is there in the, uh, the economy, is also there in the erotic economy in the story. So even at, the, at a conjugal sexual level, uh, it's completely unproductive. There's no relationship at all between the men and the wives. And all that they do, the two men, uh, they, they continue playing chess all the time. And you know, if we can extend that narrative farther, further, you find that a game of chess almost becomes something like a homoerotic bond uh, between these two men. And they just run away from the families. Uh, they steal away from everyone and they meet clandestinely, uh, almost like a rendezvous of lovers uh, to continue playing the game of chess. So again, it's like two men uh, uh, who are using this game of chess to produce proximity, uh, to produce intimacy. Uh, uh, and that's how this intimacy and proximity continues forever, uh, taking them away from this heteronormative, uh, you know, productive principle of economy, sexuality, uh, familial duties, etc. Right? So that, that is the long and short of the story that we need to bear in mind for the purpose of this particular course. Right, okay. So with the little time we have for the session, let's dive into the text and see how the content of the text just corroborates uh, the discussion we just had. So this should be on your screen now, uh, the chess plays by 
uh, Munshi Premchand. I'm going to read out the first section from the screen and you can follow it from the screen as you uh, hear me. Okay. It was in the times of Wazid Ali Shah. Lucknow was drowned in sensuality. The big and small, the rich and the poor, all were sunk in it. So again, the whole idea of being drowned in sensuality is the opening uh, of this particular story. Everyone is sinking in sensuality. I mean, everyone is just full of pleasure all the time. Everyone is intoxicated. Uh, different kinds of sensuality, art, you know, alcohol, opium, etc. And we are given up little description of the kinds of sensuality which were there, prevalent in Lucknow at that point of time. Some were engrossed in dance and music, some just reveled in the drowsiness induced by opium. So again, opium becomes uh, an important uh, metaphor, an important symbol over here. Uh, it's an uh, instrument of numbness. Uh, it's something which is going to numb your nerves uh, and again make you unproductive, make you uh, lethargic in quality. So opium will induce lethargy in you, opium will induce a sleep in you, opium will induce intoxication in you and that, in, in that induction or into intoxication is something which is uh, obviously pathological, obviously non-productive uh, and you know it, it takes away from the principles of production and productivity and you know, takes it towards the principles of uh, pleasure. So again we find the entire focus is towards the production of the pleasure principle rather than the productive principle. So opium becomes a very key symbol right at the beginning of the story. And then we are told love of pleasure dominated every aspect of life. So you know hedonism was the only uh, uh, principle around in administration, in literature, in social life, in arts and crafts, in business and industry, in cuisine and custom, sensuality ruled everywhere. So that was a meta narrative, right? In administration, in politics, in art, in culture, in business, in industry, everywhere, uh, people were just interested in being, in finding pleasure, in, in, in enjoying pleasure. So it became uh, a complete economy of enjoyment rather than any economy of responsibility or productivity, right? So that, that, that's interesting. Uh, description right at the beginning that we see. Uh, sensuality ruled everywhere. So that becomes the ruling principle, the meta principle. Uh, the state officials were absorbed in fun and pleasure, poets and descriptions of love and separation, artisans in Zari and Sikon work, businessmen in dealings with in Surma, perfumes and cosmetics. So again, you find that none of these things which are described away, if you look at the material markers, uh, Surma, uh, cosmetics, perfumes, uh, Zari, second uh, you know, love and separation, uh, fun and pleasure, none of these things are necessary. So the non-necessary condition uh, of the material is important for us. So all these materials are excessive in quality. These are materials that you go for when everything is taken care of, right? When the, the necessity is taken care of, then you go for these pleasure principles, uh, these pleasure activities, these pleasure markers. So uh, when do you use perfume, for instance? You use perfumes when uh, all the other needs are taken care of, when food is taken care of, shelter is taken care of, basic clothing is taken care of. Then you go for things like perfume, then you go for things such as uh, surma and cosmetics, right? So the entire economy, as you can see, is geared uh, towards excessivity. Right? And that excessivity is important for us to understand because, you know, that, that takes away the, the entire focus on necessity. So it's a very non-necessity driven economy. It's a complete economy which is driven towards excessivity. It's a production and consumption of excess which is taking place over here. And that will be the downfall of this kingdom. That will obviously, that is a marker of the decadence of the kingdom. Uh, that's, that underlines the decadence, that excessivity principle. Okay. All were drowned in sensual pleasures. No one knew what was happening uh, around the world. So again, uh, that sensuality and the excessivity also produces insularity. Uh, it cuts you off from everything around the world. It cuts you off from any real engagement with anything real outside this little you know, sensual bubble that's Lucknow, right? So Lucknow becomes a little sensual bubble where everyone's drowning and sinking in sensuality, excessivity, etc. Whereas uh, there's a complete disconnect from reality uh, and from any real engagement with any real world outside. So as you can see that it becomes a very soft target, a very low hanging fruit. Uh, for the company to take over, the East Indian company to take over, they just come and take it over, just territorialize it, um, own it completely because they have obviously invested lots of money uh, to the um, uh, the kingdom, the, the Nawab had borrowed money presumably and enormous amounts from the company and uh, is on a position now to return the money. So it just becomes a financial transaction, it's like a you know, bank taking over um, you know, a defaulter or something like that. So there's no resistance whatsoever and that's how 
in the East India Company operator at the beginning, as we know, it was a very mercantile enterprise. It would lend money to all those kingdoms and then ensure that all the kingdoms would become defaulters uh, and then it would just take over the kingdom. So, you know, before it began, uh, before it became a fully military organization, it was essentially a mercantile organization and it operated and took control and took ownership and territorialized everything through this mercantile processes. Okay, that's something which is important for us to understand today, looking back at the history of imperialism. Okay, so what kinds of sensual pleasures were going on? Uh, well, we know, no one knew what was happening in the real world outside. So, quail fights were on, rings were being readied for patriot fights, uh, somewhere the game of Chosa was being played, with its attended shouts on the winning throw. So, we have bird fights, we have pigeon fights, we have some kind of dice game happening on the streets all the time. So, if you take a look at the streets, the visual narrative over here. Imagine or visualize the streets of Lucknow where everyone is just shouting and gambling and there's a lot of gamble going on with bird fights, etc. So, no real work is getting done. So, every the entire focus of the economy, the entire focus of the energy is towards gambling, towards intoxication, towards sensuality, etc. Which is obviously none of it is part of the linear productive principle of uh, you know, economic or administrative control. Okay, uh, elsewhere, a pitch chessboard battle was on from the king from the king to the pop-up, uh, all were engrossed in these pleasures. So much so, that if a beggar received money in arms, they preferred to spend it in opium or extract rather than bread. So, again, this becomes a very important marker, that if a beggar got money uh, by begging, uh, some arms, some money given to that person, uh, that money would be spent by opium rather than bread. So, the preference for opium rather than bread becomes very, very important. Because as I just mentioned a little while ago, that bread would be a marker of necessity, as a marker of nourishment uh, or necessary nourishment, whereas opium over here becomes a marker of excessive nourishment, sensual nourishment, it's something that you do to your body at an excessive level, right? It's an intoxication, it's psychedelic in quality, etc. Now, the preference for opium rather than bread becomes a very important marker, and again, look at the way in which uh, uh, the degree of condensation uh, takes place, right? So, you know, it's just everything is condensed together uh, into little material markers which are reflective of the bigger macro economy going on, uh, the macro operations going on in the economy. So, what Prem Chan is telling us, what the narrator is telling us here is that you know, if a beggar in a Lucknow gets money, then he will go and buy opium or its extract. Uh, even the money is less, he will buy an extract of opium or the money is more, he will buy real opium, but not bread. And that preference, that bias towards opium rather than bread uh, is reflective of the bigger bias over here, the bigger political macro cultural bias towards sensuality, towards hedonism, towards pleasure rather than towards um, the necessary things. Okay, uh, playing games like chess or cards or gazifa sharpens the mind, improves mental faculty and helps in solving complex problems. Such arguments have been forcefully advanced. So, you know, people started consuming the knowledge, the belief that, you know, playing games like chess or, you know, gambling or cards, uh, they, they sharpen the mind. So, you know, let's just play it. So, there's some justification, some pseudo knowledge, some pseudo theory justifying all these activities in some sense. That let's all sharpen our minds or wits or faculties rather than doing mundane things. Uh, people subscribing to this thesis uh, can be found even today. So, again, it cut back in, in current time. And um, Naret is telling us that you know, such people who subscribe or consume these beliefs can be found even today. So, if Mirza Shahjad uh, Ali and Mir Roshan Ali, so Mir and Mirza are the two people over here, uh, the two protagonists in the story, spend most of the time sharpening their wits, how could any thoughtful person take exceptions? There's an ironic tone over here, saying that if Mirza and me they play chess all the time, that's just sharpening their wits, how would, why would someone object to it, right? Both of them were hereditary uh, Zagidas, free from the worries of the livelihood. Uh, they enjoy the good food without having to work at all. What else could they do? So, again, and I'll stop here at this point, but this is an ex excellent example of how the feudal economy worked. Uh, the very dynastic feudal economy where people just get rich because they happen to belong to a certain family. Uh, money would just uh, percolate, money would just keep coming in because there was some land somewhere uh, in which some farmers are working and they have to pay off some money because they're working on the farm. So, that money comes then to these people and there are several such farms, several such lands in the parts of the kingdom. So, they don't have to do anything at all. They can just live off the ancestors land. They can just live off the ancestors property uh, and do nothing at all uh, to do for their own livelihood, right? And all they can do, all they need to do is be needless. All they need to do is being uh, hedonistic, superfluous. 
So the entire idea of the superfluous consumption becomes important, or conspicuous consumption becomes important. They're always intoxicated, they're always playing chess all the time. They're smoking hookah, uh, they're taking opium, they're drinking alcohol, they're playing chess, they're gambling. Uh, so none of these activities, as I mentioned, uh, relate or correspond to any productive principle. Uh, they're all driven towards the pleasure principle because they don't have to be productive all the time. You know, they, they can't just be pleasurable because the money is just going to come in anyway. Uh, and a sense of entitlement that this economy generates is something which um, characterizes their masculinity. Uh, they don't really have to answer to anyone, neither to the wives, nor to their subjects, nor to their children, to no one because there is this money coming in all the time. And that entitlement uh, generates uh, a certain set of characters which inform these personalities. And that's the uh, I mean, when we look at Meza and me as two bodies, two individuals, but what Prem Jan is going to tell us is that these people are very, very, uh, they, they exemplify perfectly the bigger macro economy, the bigger macro cultural condition of Lucknow at that point of time, which is the setting in which the story is situated, where the, uh, the companies is going to come in. And as I mentioned, Lucknow is a very, very low hanging fruit. Uh, it's, all it takes is a takeover, financial takeover. There's no military resistance at any level whatsoever. Right, and that becomes the setting of the story. And this is right before the Sipai Rebellion. Because as I know, the, the Sipai Rebellion made one significant change. Uh, the, the company rule came to an end in India and a queen took over. So when we tell today, when we say today that the British ruled India for 200 years, we need to be a bit careful about dividing it. Because for the first 100 years, it was the company rule. Uh, the company ruled it, uh, you know, they, like I mentioned, they ruled it through financial transactions, through lending money and making the kingdoms defaulters and then taking over the kingdoms. It was a very easy process. And in the process, they generated an army, they generated a territory, uh, it became more and more territorialized through army, etc. But after the Sipai Rebellion in 1857, the company room officially, the company rule officially came to an end and the Queen of England took over and that was when England as a country ruled India. So it was, technically speaking, England ruled for 100 years and the company ruled for the first 100 years. So that is the setting of the story. And this story is situated at the cusp of these two uh, regimes. So it is between the company rule and the uh, Queen rule. It was right before uh, you know, the Sepoy Rebellion would take place. So that's the setting, the historical uh, location of the story, which we, I believe we described in some details. So from the next lecture, we'll just move on with the text and see how the content of the text corroborates and is reflective of the political, cultural conditions, which it took some time to describe. So we'll continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.